Welcome to Sunday night, everybody. This is Dr. Boz, and I can honestly say I've never made that mistake before. <laughs> All right, I am definitely a quarter after the hour tonight and running a little behind, but I will tell you that I locked myself out of my office. <laughs> I got here, got all set up, have everything tested, and then I went to go to the bathroom right before I started, and I totally locked myself out. <laughs> so my phone was in there, my keys were in the office, and I had to go to the neighbor and call my husband to get the keys to bring to here. So a super big thanks to husband who saved the day. <laughs> so I do have a really good show for you tonight. I think I have some things that I, um, I think you'll be interested in and I've been counting down to. I've been doing a lot of reading this week on how we've, um, we can learn about and we have learned about the um, white blood cell system, your red blood cell system, and what it does for um, the, the ailing bodies. So I, there's a few traditions I do here on the Dr. Boz channel. If you're new, one of them is I try to, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you, Rick, for saying that's such an accomplishment because as I'm sitting there at four minutes to the hour going, oh no, what am I going to do? My husband uh, is uh, at home and he knows better than to like get too close to me when I'm getting ready for this show. <laughs> so as I was so prepared and ready, and then I wasn't. <laughs> so thanks for that comment. Uh, other um, uh, things I do on this traditional <laughs> uh, Sunday night is almost every Sunday I seem to have a hiccup. There's going to be a, a, a day when maybe the final show and I don't have a mess up. You'll know that I've mastered the skill and <laughs> maybe not. All right, so one of the things I do is I check my own blood sugars and blood ketones at the beginning of the show and I try to do it at the end of the show. Um, usually I have something, oh, I do have a drink. I'm not drinking ketones this time. Last week I said I wasn't drinking ketones and I was drinking ketones. Um, and I couldn't figure out during the show why it tasted so sweet. Like why, why is that sweet? Yeah, it was because there was ketones in there. All right, so this is my ketone meter. Uh, you'll see that that little blinking drip, drip of blood is really important. You cannot touch the, the strip to that until the ma machine is ready. Ketones take about 10 seconds. This is the same type of meter, but it has a white one in there, and you can see that drip of blood is waiting for me. Uh, and uh, this one only takes about five seconds. So ketones are, are 0.8, and blood sugar is 96. That probably has everything to do with the last 15 minutes. Uh, but we'll check it at the end of the hour and see what it looks like. So um, I do appreciate uh, the uh, signal I sent out to, to send messages to you saying, I'm counting down, I'm counting down. Um, so I um, will also put out a couple of announcements at the beginning of the show. Uh, first of all, those of you that have already done what I ask uh, every week, which is tell me that you can hear me and see me. So I saw that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't have a publisher or a producer. <laughs> so when things go wrong, I know because you're telling me on the comments. <laughs> so thank you. Um, some other things that have happened in the last week is I really thought I was going to have a funeral for my dad. Uh, his kidneys no longer work, and the process of uh, living without kidneys has taught him how to use peritoneal dialysis uh, to keep up with his needs of his cleaning his blood. Um, he had been living in the same town as me for about 10 weeks, which made it really nice just to check on him and to really um, be a part of his day-to-day -day life. And then mom and him headed back to the farm, which is about 100 miles from here. That was last Thursday. Uh, we have uh, our keto support group here in Sioux Falls. Uh, actually, I didn't put this microphone on. I'm not sure if you can hear me well enough there. So I don't know if that helps or hurts. Um, Anyway, uh, we have uh, our Dr. Ba or our keto support group here in Sioux Falls on Friday mornings. And so I got up the next morning and I did my group. And uh, at the end of the group, I got this text that said, from my mother, that said, he can't stand up. So I knew he was nauseated and thought I, he just couldn't keep down his antibiotics. We knew he had an infection recently. So I went to the pharmacy, got an injectable form of his antibiotic, drove to the farm 100 miles later to find my dad 
barely hanging on to his life. Um, I put him in the car, drove him back to Sioux Falls, and last Sunday I was I spent the whole day at the at the hospital right up until the show and truly did not expect him to pull through that. At the time, we didn't know where the infection was, but about 12 hours later, he was diagnosed with pseudomonas. And those are, that's one of those infections that uh, once it's in your blood, it's really difficult to treat it. Um, as an internal medicine physician, I've had uh, a couple of patients in their 30s that got um, pseudomonas. They were very sick. One died uh, because it's such a tough infection. So when I learned that that was what was brewing in his blood, I, I really held little hope that, I mean, I prayed and I asked for people to pray and I'll give all the glory to God because it, he lived, <laughs> he's alive. He's actually at my house right now. And um, he responded to the antibiotics, but it plays into tonight where I talk about how did he survive? Um, how did, he lived through, I mean, he had 30,000 white blood cell count. He had pseudomonas um, in the cultures in his lung, uh, and it was just awful. And at almost 77, with no kidneys, how were his white blood cells strong enough to fight that off? They shouldn't have been. So tonight we're going to talk about how to improve your white blood cells and your... Um, <clears throat> your white blood cells and your red blood cells. I'm going to show you some red blood cells from mine. A couple of weeks ago, I um, <laughs> I had uh, given you some foreshadowing that I was going to talk about this tonight. And if I, I've been working on the keynote pr presentation or the slide presentation, and I think it's pretty good uh, to connect both white blood cells and red blood cells um, on this uh, presentation. Um, I... I really wanted to, I think this is going to, okay, that's what I wanted to say. And then I wanted to um, see this for a second. Hmm, that's not, that's not good. Okay, well, I hope I can find that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get started on uh, the keynote presentation. Uh, and then I will tell you a little bit more about Let's go here. Let's make sure that preview looks okay. Okay, so I think I think that's going to be okay. All right, so again, I'm trying to check a couple things. I did a very naughty thing. I did an update on my Mac computer this past week, uh, and um, the death of uh, my, the near death of, <laughs> death of my father was almost the near death of my MacBook, which I refuse to replace until I'm done writing my book. Uh, which may sound ridiculous and stubborn, but I just do not want to deal with making all these things work on another computer. And um, I went to set up this right before I locked myself out. And that um, keynote is just barely hanging on by a thread. So let's hope it works. Uh, I have, do have some folks standing by saying, just make sure they can see what it is I'm trying to show them. So we are going to start on, um, let's see here. I want to go to... Let's do a transition to that. Um, all right, I think that works. Okay, so what I am going to do, so we are going to start. The, the, the title of tonight is um, How to Make Healthier Red Blood Cells and White Blood Cells. And in, in light of the coronavirus and its uh, sweeping... Uh, uh, a capture of everybody's conversation, uh, I think it's best to learn about some of the things like your white blood cells and why in the world <clears throat> they would um, they would uh, be so strong in a 77-year-old uh, who's fighting off one of the most deadly infections that even with antibiotics, we only improve uh, their outcomes by a few percentage points. It is really up to their immune systems to fight this and by golly, uh, I cannot believe how much better he is in one week. Um, so I'm going to push play here and see if uh, this works like it's supposed to. Let's hope. It, uh, so I need to push transition and I'm going to push play. Okay, so this is the scariest part uh, because 
I, you're not gonna be able to, I'm not gonna be able to see you I don't think I maybe I will be able to see you with this new setup um, so what I'm looking at here is what oh yeah I can't see you so hopefully this uh, works out well for <laughs> what's going on behind the scenes here um, what makes uh, white blood cells um, uh, healthier and what makes red blood cells healthier. So a few weeks ago, I showed you a couple of uh, embarrassing moments for me. And that is when I was teaching about the red blood cell, or uh, excuse me, about cholesterol and about heart disease, I really uh, wanted a, um, I wanted to find another op option for measuring something that could matter when it comes to heart disease. And unfortunately, when you look at a uh, total cholesterol or a lipid panel, although there are some hints about health inside a cholesterol panel, it is not just a simple look at the top number total cholesterol, look at your LDL or bad cholesterol, and know if you're going to have a heart attack. That's not true. That isn't how it works. You have to have a complex level of thinking that goes on to improve um, uh, your analysis, if you would, on what happens in uh, the risk of a heart attack. So I went off, I mean, this was probably four or five months because there's a chapter in the book about this too, where I'd said, yes, if you want to look backwards in your health, um, getting a coronary artery calcium score is a great snapshot in time to say how much calcium is inside your, your coronary arteries. And when you know, when you have, um, if you live in a metropolitan area, most cardiologists will do them for about $50 and you do not need to see the doctor ahead of time. So it's a great low radiation uh, capture of looking at how much calcium is in the coronary arteries of the patient. And from that coronary artery calcium score, we can make a pretty good prediction about the risk of a heart attack at that moment and over the next few years. If you're lucky enough to have a coronary artery calcium score of zero, the chances you're going to die of a heart attack in the next 10 years is the lowest of all of the uh, quartiles or patient populations. So having a CAC of zero gives you time to fix whatever might have gone wrong with your health. If you're like my dad, who had coronary artery calcium score that I did not need to check, because on his chest x-ray, I could see the calcium in the arteries going to his heart. <laughs> That's really bad. I don't want to know what his coronary artery calcium score is, but I do not need to waste his money on looking because the first thing that the, the uh, cardiology team would probably do is try to put a stent in him or try to, you know, see if he's having a near heart attack. And I'm like, no, 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 don't touch him. We are working on other ways to prevent his heart attack. Uh, he's already, I mean, he's already calcified his coronary ar arteries. I don't think with his lack of kidneys that he has a life expectancy that would be long enough to reverse the calcium. It doesn't mean that other people don't, but in his case, I probably can't undo that calcium in his heart, uh, in the arteries to his heart, but I can do a few other things. All right, so in my search to say what else is out there, I shared an embarrassing moment where I had found this awesome test where you take red blood cells, um, and as you can see in this picture, red blood cells are made of uh, lipids or, or fat lining the cell membrane, like every Every cell has, see that the little balls on the outside are water soluble, the little strings are actually strings of fat, and that, that bilipid layer, which means there's, there's a, a string of, there's, there's water soluble balls on the outside, water soluble balls on the inside, and then the fat goes towards one another, and the distribution of different kinds of fat uh, really do speak to how flexible are those red blood cells. So you're going to see in this picture, there's uh, some words we're going to learn about in a minute. I, I want you to notice that the red ones are called trans fats, and the trans fats are the ones that are the most dangerous. So we're going to go into them a little bit more. Um, I I'm going to skip that slide because we're going to come to a better picture of it in just a second. Uh, when looking at the different types of fats, here you can see that monounsaturated fats are... Um, are one type of fat. Saturated fats are another type of fat. Um, trans fats are the ones that are the most deadly for the for humans. What um, the saturated fats can be further divided into these omega-3 and omega-6 fats. 
Now, I have not talked much about these on my channel. I like keeping it simple, but there are a few things you do need to know about some fats once you've become uh, a little more seasoned in the ketogenic world. So let me just put some caveats out there. If you were my patient and if you were in, in my keto group, I would have nothing to say in this level of education in the first six weeks. I would tell you, eat butter, eat steak, eat anything except seed oils. Like if I could get you to not eat the seed oils, I would. that would be the only thing I would tell you about fats. Uh, I don't want them looking at the types of fats. I want them getting very used to eating fat and feeling full. But as you do journey into your older years and want to see, well, what's my risk of all this fat? Can I monitor some things that do improve my health? One of them being, how did my dad fight off that ridiculously lethal level of pseudomonas in his body? And I contend it's because he has flexible white blood cells. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so these are the five different kinds of fats. We're going to break them down a little bit further. Uh, I do love this slide that says you can find out what fats make up your cells uh, with omega-3 index. Uh, the, this, this test is something that I put out the, uh, about five or six weeks ago when I did all this research to find that there is a test you can do where you measure the kinds of fats that are found in the skin of your red blood cells that um, we know that eating a lot of saturated fat does not directly increase the level of saturated fat in your blood, uh, but eating a lot of carbohydrates can change the way your fats turn up in your body. So testing matters because it's not just about what fats you eat, it's also about what level of insulin you've been living with. So here's that uh, picture again. Uh, I actually was going to start there, so <laughs> sorry about that. This was supposed to be my starting one. Uh, I like to think of the polyunsaturated fats as, um, we're going to talk about those in just a second, as an antifreeze. Um, they really keep that, um, they keep the, um, the, the membrane of your cells very fluid. Um, and we're going to talk about how to get polyunsaturated fats. We're going to compare them to monosaturated fats, which really are, um, they're the ones that are liquid at room temperature, but they would turn solid if you put them in the refrigerator. Um, so like olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil might be some examples of monounsaturated fats. Uh, don't get, don't, don't let your eyes glaze over. Here's a, a little better way to talk about this. So when I'm teaching students or when I'm teaching patients about fats, the two things I like them to know are there are some fats that your body will make. And most, and the monounsaturated, the MUFAs, if you would, are the ones that your body uh, can make them from other fats. They are not essential, meaning if you do not eat Ma MUFA, and I'll put those, that slides in there, monounsaturated fats, which is, um, they are not essential. Your body will make them. It is the essential fats that we're going to focus on tonight, and they have everything to do with the best way to fight off your coronavirus worries, uh, the way my dad fought off Pseudomonas at 76 without kidneys, um, is your polyunsaturated fats, which are essential. And these essential fats um, are also the antifreeze to these white, the, 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 the lining of your cells. So when we look at how to uh, separate these two, the non-essential ones are the monounsaturated fats, your body will make them. If you don't eat them, you'll be fine. But essential means they are essential for life. If you don't eat them, you are going to die. When I take care of vegans or people that have really had uh, a long journey of um, no animal products, uh, the, the places where their brain isn't working well and their immune system's falling apart, their energy level is low, is because these essential fats were not, they didn't eat enough of them to stay above a certain threshold of health. So let's back, unpack this a little further. Uh, the, the two major things that I want you to remember are the two types, if you would, of polyunsaturated fats. These are animal fats, they are essential, and they are divided into two good guys, but one is better than the other. So one is called omega-6, the other one is omega-3. 
And if you could uh, put in a summary statement the difference between omega-6 and omega-3, I would summarize omega-3 as reducing inflammation in your body, whereas omega-6 actually can help rise inflammation. It also helps to create some of the hormones. So many times I hear uh, omega-6 is evil, omega-3 is great. And I don't, I don't really like them to do that because they're both essential. You have to have both of them. You cannot make them. And when, when although omega-3 does reduce inflammation, and we're going to go through some things that omega-3 does predict, I would contend that the worst part about um, labeling good and bad for omega-6 and omega-3 is they think that you should have no omega-6. And, and that's just not true. So as we uh, separate out, you're going to see some really wonderful words here, but one of them is that omega-6 has two types of um, subfats, if you would, gamma linoleic acid and then the conjugated linoleic acid. Uh, you'll never hear me say those again. Those are just omega-6 fats. What you will hear, and you will see a lot of this on labels. So if you were going to take notes or you're going to take a screenshot, I'll, I'll show you the one I want you to take in just a second. So omega-3... Uh, has uh, alpha linoleic acid. ALA is what you'll see it abbreviated on. Uh, if you go to your, <laughs> if you push pause and you go to your um, medicine cabinet or your supplement cabinet, uh, you can say when when alpha linoleic acids are present, uh, you'll start to see some health advertisements like, oh, our source of omega three is uh, ALA, and they probably won't write out that Latin name. There are two subsets that ALA breaks down into, and uh, it's based on the shape of them. I don't, I'm sure you don't care, but I care. So it's, it's abbreviated EPA, but uh, the title of it is Icosapentoic Acid, and there's a reason it's abbreviated. <laughs> I think it's actually called Icosa. Icosapentoic Acid, and the other one is Docosa hexa, Hexonic docosa hexonic acid, anyway, abbreviated DHA. The key here is that if you write down EPA and DHA, these are the two omega-3 fatty acids that are where most of the literature comes from and most of the people monitoring uh, 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 health benefits for these uh, two very special kinds of fats come into play. On the ketogenic diet, where animal fats are really what we are encouraging people to eat from because uh, of the polyunsaturated fats, but also because uh, of that low inflammatory markers, uh, you will find that uh, there's people like me who were born on a hog, hog farm and beef farmer's daughter, and I easily eat a lot of omega-6, but wait till you see my results that they were dismal <laughs> when it came to uh, the omega-3s. So this, uh, this is just a quick screenshot. What I really want people to remember is omega-3, ALA is the, is the mothership, but it's divided into EPA and DHA. And those are the things you should be looking for on the backside of a supplement bottle. So a couple of the things I like to show folks is that um, if you measure the amount of EPA and DHA in red blood cells, you can, uh, you, you can uh, take that as a percentage of the total fat. So um, in this person right here, uh, their percentage, there are 64 in that blue box. Th those strings uh, are different types of fat. And the three red ones are the good ones, these EPA and DHA. Uh, so, but there's only three out of the 64, which brings the percentage down to 4.6. Now, the danger is, is uh, that's pretty close to what my number turned out to be. <laughs> so... For other folks that have been around the channel a while, you know that I did use um, uh, hemoglobin A1C is another way that we measure inside your red blood cells how, how sticky they are by how much sugar they've been associated with. And I love that one. It's not actually one of my most popular uh, videos, but I love it because as I teach people about uh, hemoglobin A1C or watching to see why it's so important to get that hemoglobin A1C. In my, in my clinic, I love them below 4.6, uh, at 4.6 or lower. And the reason why is because as your red blood cells uh, get impacted by sugar, 
They can't carry oxygen as well, which is why my diabetics with really high A1Cs, they have strokes more often, they have um, infections more often, they lose fingers and toes, uh, and it's because the oxygen carrying capacity inside your red blood cells has fallen victim uh, to being saturated in sugar. And when the sugar, when the glucose is there, the oxygen can't be there. So that's one way we study red blood cells. This is a completely different way that we use the same cell and we get to measure over the last 100 days, which is about how long a red blood cell lasts, how, have my, uh, how has my eating been? Because the fats used to make my red blood cells came from what I consumed and I can look at what I consumed in that test. All right, so let's do a couple more little things here. Omega-3 and inflammation. This is the part where in the last week I put a ton of time studying what is it about um, inflammatory markers and infection that I wanted people to know. Uh, so there is a correlation between these omega-3 index, and again, mine was really bad, uh, and the multiple inflammation markers found in this Framingham study. Um, so Essentially, the higher your omega-3 index, the lower your inflammation. I had a couple of other calls from the community uh, where, where friends and family, or family, family of friends, <laughs> is a better way to say that, had a stroke. And instantly I wanted to like drive home this point that I was going to be talking about on Sunday, saying the flexibility of those red blood cells are how you would have prevented a stroke. That has to do with how many trans fats are gonna be found in her red blood cells, and how many omega-6 and omega-3 are gonna be found in her red blood cells. I'm gonna explain that further in just a second. So that little thing that flashed across there is just a, a, a brief, I didn't think anybody would appreciate the study, so uh, I thought I would explain it this way, but I, I wanted to, mainly that thing that flew across the screen was for me to remember. Yes, this is a, a study, it was 2019 that this, um, Actually, this was 2015. Uh, the other one I'm gonna go through is 2019. where well, they looked at omega-3, the same little thing that I had, I did live a couple of uh, videos ago. And it said, uh, we can predict who's going to have a heart attack better with this little prick of your finger where you do not need a doctor's prescription. You can send off to the, uh, through that website. They'll mail you the kit. You can prick your own finger, put your red blood cells on that circle, send it back in and get your report and you do not need a doctor's prescription to do that. When they looked at the results of people to, uh, who had omega-3 uh, reports, so omega-3 indexes, like, like we're gonna go through in a second with me, uh, they could see that it was a predictor of inflammation, meaning the higher your omega-3, the lower your inflammation markers. And I, I really think it's important to sit still and realize that they took into account several things that made it really hard for this study. If they would have done this kind of a study when using LDL cholesterol, you would never have LDL cholesterol predicting anything. I mean, it barely predicts something now. But they took into account that if they were a smoker, they gave them consideration. If their blood pressure was high, they gave them consideration. If their body mass index was heavy, they gave them consideration. They paid attention to total cholesterol, which I don't care about, but I do care about that they gave them credit if they had a high, a high or low healthy cholesterol, HDL. They looked at their triglycerides. They gave them a little uh, a smudge room for with, if they were diabetic, if their glucose was high, if they'd taken an aspirin in the last three weeks, if they were on hormone replacement therapy, or if they were on a statin. Now, there's several others, but those were the big ones where I'm like, if you want to make it difficult for this test to predict in, uh, inflammatory markers or inflammation, then uh, you would put all of those in the formula. And if it's still separated, you should have a lot of confidence that this test predicts who's going to have a stroke, who's going to have a heart attack. And there were several studies that, uh, that showed this, but I, I think this one was the one that helped me get to the punchline. So the, there's that study again, just reminding you, this isn't, this is, you can go look it up if you want to look at the source at the bottom of the slide. But what I think is, um, <laughs> is helpful is these eight biomarkers. Now, I want you to notice that R, when R is negative, it means there's an inverse correlation. And the further away from one you get, the more you can be confident that there was a real separation. So after they took in all of those factors, they said that there are 
um, there was a urinary uh, iso Pro stains, I don't even know what those are, but when I looked them up, I was like, okay, you're right, that is an increased inflammatory marker. So the higher those were, the lower your omega-3. The higher your omega-3, the lower your urinary isoprostains. Um, the lipoproteins that predicted both the size of them and their activity. Uh, interleukin-6, which is really important for what my dad went through this past week. Uh, your body's ability to send out the message that there's a bad infection and then kill the infection without killing the patient. Uh, so again, a really important hormone that talks between cells saying, hey, uh, we need to take care of this, uh, this infection. And the inflammatory marker does not work very well if their omega-3 had been lower. Or yeah, if their omega-3 had been lower. So C-reactive protein, again, very common. Uh, I've talked about that several times on the show. Tumor necrosis factor was also an important part of that. And uh, the other two are smaller, but uh, were, were part of this. So as I look at uh, these red blood cells, I just want you to notice how in that, uh, on those cells on the side, they are disc shaped. They have an indent in the middle and they kind of have a round, like almost a um, like an inner tube if you were going to put a a wrap around an inner tube. The outside is fuller and the inside indents. And the reason why that happens is uh, you can see that all of these come from the bone marrow. We're going to talk about red blood cells today, but the red blood cells are made in the same bath of, of inflammatory markers that your white blood cells and your platelets. And we could go on and on and on about all the things that happen after that in your lymph cells, but that's for a different topic. When you look at red blood cells and how well they wiggle through uh, that calcified area that my dad had in his coronary arteries, it's dependent on how much antifreeze is inside those little cells. Okay, so that sounds weird, right? Antifreeze is that mention I had earlier that if you want these, these, these red blood cells that squish through a tight opening in your arteries uh, throughout your body, or if you're looking for them to not clot, not be sticky, we, want, we call those healthy, and it's, they're healthy because they are able to change shape as they go through those tiny little parts of your body. That is predictive if you've got more omega-3 and more omega-6 and less trans fats in your red blood cells. So I like to think of them as healthy red blood cells versus not healthy red blood cells. It might be a little bit rudimentary, but I think you're gonna get the punchline here. So if your omega-3 index is high, you have healthy red blood cells. Uh, we know that cholesterol in general, and I know cholesterol gets this really bad reputation for being this heart attack predictor, but it is your fuel, it is your energy. And when cholesterol uh, is, in, is in flux, in flowing, I, the other, about two weeks ago, I went through how cholesterol, when it's stuck and it cannot recycle, that's when it oxidizes, it becomes a bullet inside their blood vessels. When cholesterol is doing its job and delivering energy and then recycling back through the liver, when it's in that fluid motion, that is when it's doing its job and it's a predictor of healthy red blood cells. Animal fats predict flexible red blood cells. Low trans fats, and that's really important uh, for when we, we bring a little bit of credibility back to my report here. So again, just looking at the unhealthy red blood cells, uh, here we've got a picture of those glucose floating through there. That's a high inflammatory state. We know that uh, A1Cs are going to be um, higher. The, the body will have a higher sticky factor, if you would. Um, and as you look at unhealthy red blood cells, they get into tiny little places and they block, they block the flow of blood. Uh, that's the dangerous part. When you look at unhealthy red blood cells, as your DHA, uh, as your red blood cells finding those two, uh, two cell components, um, uh, excuse me, two fat components found in red blood cells, your EPA and DHA, the higher those numbers got, the higher the percentages got, uh, the less there was a heart attack. So again, highly correlated uh, to preventing heart attacks when you could raise your uh, omega-3s within your red blood cells. Okay, so this is the part where um, I'm going to tell you my number from here. I, I thought I had a slide connected to this, but it appears that is still not working. That's the foreshadowing I gave you at the beginning saying I wonder how that's going to work out. 
So the desirable range, when I got my test back, I was at, I think it was 4.3. <laughs> 4.3. So you can see that a typical for the United States is uh, right around a four, and I'm definitely there. Uh, my my uh, omega-3 index was 4.3. So that came back about two weeks ago, and in the past week, I have um, been using my chronometer app, which I, I don't know if I'll have time to teach about that tonight. I was going to go through that tonight, but uh, chronometer is the one thing I took away from, I took a lot of things away, but the biggest thing I've implemented in my practice is that the one uh, um, app that is free that I want my patients keeping track of their uh, nutrition with is the chronometer app. The reason why is I can track things like omega-3. I can also look at micronutrients if you run into problems. So most of the other apps out there, it's wonderful that they're free, but the way their nutrition has been backed up um, has had some errors. So I, again, learned from the mistakes of some of the other physicians, and they all said once we uh, had, uh, we insisted that patients use that chronometer app, I hope you never need to pay for the real version. It is only like $20 a, a year if you do that. Maybe it's $25 a year, but it's super cheap if you do need the full version. But even without it, it works on your phone, it works on a computer, and oh my goodness, you can set it for the ketogenic diet. You can also say, I'm trying to improve my omega-3s, which is what I was going to show you on the app tonight, um, and trying to figure out, I, I don't eat fish very often. I'd never had a can of mackerel in my life, uh, which I did have, and it was quite good, actually. <laughs> um, but looking at supplements is another way where... If you're going to look at, if you're going to have such a, if you have an awful number, kind of like I do, uh, where my D, my, uh, my index is around that four point, four percentage points, I have, you know, in that same picture that I showed you a minute or two ago, uh, I would have three red tags in there from, from omega-3s, the rest of them are not, is the recommended daily amount to supplement with is about 1,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA. So again, take a snapshot of this, take a screenshot. Uh, Dr. Harris, who is my local colleague, is the one who not only has invented this uh, test um, actually uh, over a decade ago, and that's the embarrassing part that I keep referring to, is that this was discovered in my own medical community, and I did not know he lived here. I was reading all about this cool test and understanding that it's a really good test and it's point of care, which is what I love is when patients can control their own ability to order the test, to, to look at it, and then to make a, a change in their diet that is measurable within three to four months to say, did I do a good job? Um, I mean, I love the checking your finger with glucose and ketones. That's another point of care where you can take ownership of your health care. You can watch what needs to be done. It isn't the 20 minutes patients, 40 minutes if they're lucky, come in and see me, expect me to get all their prescriptions taken care of, know all their labs, answer all their questions, oh, and educate them on nutrition. No way. It's never going to happen. Community groups like what I hold on Friday are what I am trying to inspire people to do. So it's through this channel and the book that I'm writing and a lot of this research is trying to find those nuggets of information that say, all right, I don't sell any fish oils or any EPA, DHA. I don't have a fish farm. I, I want patients to get better and I want them to be able to measure this on their own. So um, there's, there is that recommendation. I'm going to do a little more. I know we're running up to the top of the hour, but I'm going to go over tonight because I really want to review um, your body and infection. So off to the side there, you've got red blood cells, right? They come from your bone marrow. And we just talked about how important it is that your red blood cells have some antifreeze in the lining of the skin cells of those red blood cells. And I don't mean literal antifreeze. I mean that they have some animal fat cholesterol. So omega-6 and omega-3, they do keep that, that uh, red blood cell able to change shape uh, that allows those red blood cells to squeeze through narrowed arteries throughout the body, even when you've had uh, calcification in your coronary arteries like my dad. Uh, his red blood cells have not caused any stroke and have not, um, that we know of anyway, uh, have, have not caused him to, uh, to have a lethal heart attack. But what I also want to point out is in that bone marrow, where those red blood cells are made, there's a lining to white blood cells. There are linings to platelet cells. There's linings to your heart cells, to your brain cells. 
And again, those cells have rules too. When you have a high inflammatory state, uh, you will find that your immune system does not work as well. So this slide is a little technical, so bear with me. I just wanted to point out, this is another cell membrane, and you've got some channels that change how well those um, sodium and, and uh, calcium fluctuate in and out that cell. But if you can see that pink cell at the top with the kind of purple nucleus, and it's kind of got three little parts to this nucleus, uh, that is a, a special white blood cell that is trying to detect if there's any invaders. And it's really important that if you have inflammation, that little turkey can do its job. Part of how it does its job is it's not overwhelmed with inflammation. And that inflammation will shut down your response. Um, that having a very flexible red blood cell, which you can measure, uh, and, and then having a very flexible white blood cell system, as well as low inflammatory markers, helps your body improve uh, the way it fights infection. Now, this is not an opinion. Uh, this is the study from 2019, just this last year, that looked into infectious disease and how the ketogenic diet protected uh, the gamma delta T cells. Okay, that sounds like a lot. I know. Don't 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 roll your eyes. I love this. So we're looking at how well white blood cells work inside somebody whose ketones were in a ketogenic state. Uh, ketogenic state means you have a doctor boss ratio under 80 at least, or under 40 if you're really fighting infection. When Grandpa was fighting off that pseudomonas in his body at 77, his doctor boss ratio was under 20. So his GKI, for those of you using that, uh, um, was one to one or better. So meaning more ketones than there were glucose in his body. And his immune system fought off this awfully deadly infection, way more deadly than coronavirus. Uh, this study was specifically looking at uh, taking mice, and they did, they did a really cool way of kind of keeping the carbohydrates similar, keeping their weight similar, um, but having one be in a ketogenic state, um, having another one have ketones flow, flowing, um, they, they had a unique way they did that, but they weren't metabolically making the ketones themselves, which is different. That's like if I drink ketones versus um, if I make ketones, again, making them yourself is the most robust health that we have. But it's not without uh, saying that you don't... Um, uh, you, you do increase them when you swallow ketones. But what this study showed was, um, I think I, yeah, whew, okay. Uh, I was like, did I put that in there? What this showed was that if you had a ketogenic state, you had a higher chance of fighting off influenza A. And they were able to study this by looking at how quickly the T cells, which again, that's a very special white blood cell that uh, it, it like looks for invaders. Um, there's certain T cells that take care of your skin, you know, invasions through the skin. There's certain T cells that look at your upper respiratory tract. And in this study, when they were looking at influenza A, uh, they wanted to see how well those T cells, specifically the gamma delta T cells, which most of the world doesn't care about, but those, uh, those scientists out there that are watching this, I, I do think that's a powerful deal, that they were able to watch um, the, the virus was destroyed easier. Uh, the response of that, uh, that epithelial lining where you, that's your first line of defense when something invades your body through breathing it, and that is how coronavirus gets in. Uh, you don't get the privilege of saying, okay, I'm going to wear a mask and it's not going to get through the mask. Or when you take off the mask to get a drink of water, now you breathe in air that was still there before. Uh, I've said several times on a couple of radio shows, you cannot control what happens to uh, the air around you. You can control what's happening inside your white blood cells and red blood cells. And having a state of ketosis as your primary defense for fighting infection uh, is a way better strategy <laughs> than trying to wear a mask to prevent it. Uh, wearing a mask is fine. Washing your hands is a good idea. N covering your mouth when you sneeze is very helpful for the rest of us. But if you're using that as your primary way to defend against getting an infection, you've got a failing strategy. 
Um, all right, so I'm going to flip through a couple of these. I've done these before, and I, uh, I won't do a lot of them. This, uh, so this is the one where we can predict a heart attack uh, by looking at the increased amount of omega-3. Uh, again, that's that EPA and DHA. The higher the uh, omega-3, the less likely they were to have a heart attack. Um, this one was uh, acute coronary syndrome. This is a much more, much higher study too. It was almost uh, you know, 768 cases looking at, and they were looking at if they had a omega-3 index greater than eight. Okay, so I wasn't quite in the lowest <laughs> lowest column here. My omega-3 was 4.2, um, so I'm in the middle column. Um, but I also don't think I fit in the age category that either. Uh, they did take out age, they took out race, they took out gender, history of diabetes, history of high blood pressure, history of high cholesterol, and a history of, um, of heart attacks. After all of that was taken out, you could still predict who was likely to have a heart attack and who was not based on how high their omega-3 index was. So I just think that's really powerful. I don't know if I'm communicating that well enough. I have a lot of studies that come to me and they don't do the hard choice that, I mean, it would have been easy for this little company to say, let's cherry pick our people to make our tests look better. And all that does is it deceives physicians. It deceives us in the front lines trying to say, who does this apply to? They did not do that. They made it really hard for their test to show an impact and they still kicked butt. I have goosebumps thinking about it. Like if if I would have had scientists like this showing me what LDL and total cholesterol was predicting, I would have never spent 20 years writing statins to lower them in hopes that I was preventing a heart attack, which I probably didn't prevent a one. Uh, I didn't write enough of those prescriptions to, to prevent one heart attack uh, in 20 years. That's crazy. That's awful. Anyway, off my soapbox. Okay, <laughs> so let's see. This was risk for death. Uh, again, they re the the higher your uh, um, okay. So these were actually were seventy to eighty five year olds. There were sixty five hundred postmenopausal women and lowered their risk of heart disease. Um, this one was was a heart disease. Oh, re relative risk from death from any cause. Okay, yes, this is that one. I'm sorry, I should have looked at the slide before I started speaking. This is, they lowered the risk of death of any cause between the ages of 70 and 85 if their, A1, uh, not A1C, if their omega-3 index was greater than eight. Uh, the brain health stuff on this is incredible as well. I don't have time probably to go through that tonight. Um, let's see, I think wanted to do, all right, so I'm gonna escape out of there. I am going to go to here and say, all right, so um, if you look at what I, what I was hoping to communicate, and I hope uh, it made sense to you, that uh, the, the process of being ketogenic, and every week I come on here and I show you that I am ketogenic, and I show you my numbers, and then I start my fast on Sunday nights, and if you follow me on Instagram, you would see that I have, uh, every week, I do the, the um, bold <laughs> moment of I post my numbers as I go through my fast on Instagram, and I don't quit my fast, I try not to anyway, to quit my fast until the, um, my Dr. Boz ratio, until my metabolism says, oh, you're good. And so I try to get a Dr. Boz ratio of um, under 40. And if I've been really good in the, in the last week and I had no temptations, I, I can get there in 24 hours now. Uh, that, that was not the case a year ago. It would take me two to three days to get a Dr. Boz ratio under 40. Uh, that, that's how long the fasting would take. But I come on here and show you that I'm ketogenic and, and do that at the risk of saying, no, it's not easy but it doesn't take a doctor to do it. Uh, there are some predictors that make you better at this than others. And I don't have a um, big attraction for fish. I don't not like fish. I just haven't eaten fish. <laughs> um, and it's, it's because of my community, my culture. I, I live on a, I live where we make beef and pigs. <laughs> so I eat lots of that. Uh, but I have made a commitment. So when my test came back the first week, I grieved. I totally was sad. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have it here to show you. I thought it was linked, but it's not. Um, so uh, 
let me just give you a few things that were were good and one that was not so good. So the not so good one was that my my uh, trans or my uh, omega three was only four point three. Now the good news was my trans fats were super low. Like I don't eat seed oils. I don't eat uh, margarine or Crisco. I eat animal <laughs> fat, and you can tell by looking at my omega three. Um, omega-3 index because I have lots of omega-6. Now, I, I do want you to realize that omega-6 is not the bad guy. And that's why I went through those slides. I know it can be a little sciencey, but I really think if you can remember, yes, animal fats, very good. Having um, animal fats as uh, your first level of, uh, you know, get over that threshold, get used to eating that. And when you get into a season where you're ready for the next level, or if you're worried about, um, am I doing this uh, test, am I doing this diet in a way that's hurting me? Uh, like I had a couple of uh, people write in about I've had a stroke. Uh, and again, I can't give them medical advice, but I, I, I instantly wanted to teach them, you should have flexible red blood cells. It's really important that your red blood cells can, can weave through that tiny little opening that's left in your brain or your arteries of your foot, uh, the coronary arteries to your heart. And when those red blood cells are stiff, they have too many trans fats in them, they have um, too much stiffness and inflammation, they can't make it uh, through the tiny little openings, and that is the disaster. That is where the stroke got worse. That is where those red blood cells start to stick together. And although we need them to do that when you're losing blood, we don't need them to do that spontaneously, which is where um, ischemic strokes come from. So as I look forward to... Um, some of the things I'm putting in my book. I did not go in this much detail in my book. I thought I would lose my audience, but I did put it on this video because so many people write in asking about the specifics of fats. And I don't put a lot of energy into that because it is so much more important that they had low carbohydrates, that their glucose got down, that their insulin levels went down. And you measure insulin not by going to the lab and paying $75 for insulin. You measure insulin by looking at your Dr. Boz ratio. A Dr. Boz ratio of less then 80 is a good first start. Under 40, even better. Under 20 is what I would shoot for if I was helping you with cancer or a seizure disorder or a brain injury. Um, there are uh, ways that you can raise your um, omega-3 index. Uh, I personally am choosing not to use a supplement. I'm going to try to have canned fish. Uh, I had mackerel this week. I, I went to... Um, Okay, so yeah, this is, I'll do a little bit of a plug. In the show notes, I did put the Corona, Corona, not coronavirus, the chronometer app uh, in the show notes uh, to show you that that link is a great tool. If you've already started measuring your macros on a different app and you're worried about, uh, is there a health problem I'm creating? Boy, make it easy on your doctor and use that one. It's free, but it does such a better job of tracking um, I am going to probably have a show that just dedicates what it teaches me and what it should be teaching you, um, how I've learned how to eat. I, I had to look up on the app saying, what, what is the best way to add omega-3 to my diet? And I don't live near the ocean. <laughs> so uh, canned mackerel, canned anchovies. There's a couple other uh, things I'd never had before. I've had anchovies like on a salad dressing for like a Caesar salad, but never just like the can of anchovies. Like, I didn't think that was like even an option. Um, but the, um, yeah, canned salmon was actually not, I haven't opened that can, but I bought it. <laughs> so, all right, we're 10 after the hour. I am going to recheck my sugars before I sign off. And then um, I will take a little, a quick look at your, uh, um, at your comments coming across. So for those of you that, um, uh, want, um, let's see if I had, had there's a couple other things I was going to make sure to announce, but I definitely got flustered when I locked myself out of the, <laughs> uh, um, uh, locked myself out of the office as I was about to record. How embarrassing. Oh my goodness. All right. So there's the strip for the, year, for the glucose and the ketones and, um, Actually, I don't even think I took a single drink the whole time this time. So once again, this is the, uh, it's got that little blinking dot. And so at the end of my show, those are the, that's the ketones. This is the glucose. And so again, the strip is white. And if you're not checking ketones and, glu uh, and glucose, boy, 
I will tell you, it does help. So now that yeah, my glucose didn't do much, but my ketones went up a little bit. Um, usually my ketones are about one. So that Dr. Boz ratio is really easy to do um, on, <laughs> on um, the, uh, even on live. So yeah, 99 divided by one. There you go, 99. So it's not a Dr. Boz ratio of 80. I get a lot of po folks writing and asking that question. How well, how long do you check your ratio? And although you can get a continuous glucose monitor, um, which I've done in a couple of patients, I really need to follow up with them. I haven't put them back on the show and uh, busy people, hoofta, um, to, to show you what happens when you check your own continuous glucose monitor and how much better you uh, kind of get that feedback about what's happening to your sugar, but there's not a continuous ketone monitor. And as much as that sounds like a good idea, I have talked to a few uh, manufacturers that they're like, not even close. <laughs> so uh, that's not on the horizon. So you would have to check it like six or seven times a day to get your, uh, to get enough ratio for that. I, I don't think you're, I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I do that when I fast. And it'd be great if I had a Dr. Boz ratio under 80 all the time. I think that would be my best brain function, my best um, immune system, but um, stress, <laughs> like what just happened now, I haven't eaten in hours, but my numbers will go up. All right, so I am going to uh, just do a couple more things. If you have, uh, I have people writing every week saying, how can I support the channel? Uh, right now, the Amazon products are still on hold. I am doing everything in my power to get them back up. That is a way to support the channel, but they're not available yet. I'm working through that. Pray that I don't lose my patience. Um, other things that help support the channel is the book I wrote, Any Way You Can. You can get it in your local uh, um, bookstore. Um, if you go to bozmd.com on the front page, you'll see the ISBN numbers, which is this little number, oopsie, number right here, uh, that correlates to the paperback, to the uh, Spanish version, and to the one in Chinese. It really does support the channel. Um, I am praying I have the strength to finish this book without um, losing my my patience uh, that I'm writing because the next book I'm writing the first book I wrote was a story about my mom it is meant for beginners it does not get super sciencey it tells an awesome story of a 71 year old who should have died